Welcome to Hunt Harvest Health, the podcast with your host, Ryan Lampers, a.k.a. The Stealthy Hunter. Howdy. And myself, Dr. Hillary Lampers, where we share our love for ancestral living and the health topics of the modern age. You can follow us at HuntHarvestHealth.com, Instagram, and Facebook for more podcasts, recipes, and stories. All right, let's do this. You've probably had the experience like we have here at the Stealthy Gardens. Um, you know, when you want to start your garden, the question is, what should I do? Should I build raised beds? Should I plant right in the ground? Uh, how do I even build a greenhouse? You know, where to start? And this series that we're going to be doing over the next few weeks is going to be all about answering the basic questions around gardening and what we've done over the years to get started and to just slowly, really over the years, grow an incredible garden. And a lot of the things that we feel are the most important about it. One of the big aspects that we use is we use greenhouses. Ryan, uh, we started out with small box greenhouses and we slowly evolved into a very large 30 foot by 12 foot greenhouse that Ryan built from scratch. Over the last couple of years since we've been putting this podcast out and sharing our life with others on social media, we've gotten a lot of questions related to greenhouses and how do I start one and really, what's the easiest way to start um, if I want to grow vegetables? So we have come up with a great kit that's going to help you do just that with as little work as possible. What you find out when you first start to garden is you have to build a lot of things sometimes. And if you don't have the very like mathematical building mind, um, you men out there probably have it more than us gals, but it's like, how do I build one? How do I build a greenhouse? Well, we thought we would start by helping you build your own small greenhouse on top of your garden boxes and even help you make those garden boxes easier to make. And we're calling it the Stealthy Hot Box. We also have the Stealthy Garden Box Kit. These are two kits that we're now offering on our website to make it so much easier for you to put your boxes together in your garden, as well as build a great greenhouse that can set right on top of that box without as much effort. Included in the um, Stealthy Garden Kit box are four brackets. So let's say you get your wood for your um, raised bed and you have to screw it together, hammer it together. And then over the years, what's going to happen, especially if you're using untreated wood, which we like to use because untreated wood doesn't have chemicals in it. We don't want that in our soil or in our food. So over the over time, those boxes will break down and you're probably going to have to rebuild pieces of them. So by getting the garden brackets that go in the corners, you can take your wood put a bracket right in the corner, screw it in, and that metal piece is going to hold your box together for years and years and years. So it makes it a lot quicker for those of us who aren't too handy, and it makes it a lot more sturdy. So that's the garden um, box kit, and that's just four metal brackets that are going to allow you to make a quick, easy, raised bed for your garden. If you want to add a greenhouse or something that can go on top of your goods so that you can get more heat, um, you can maybe keep as much rain out. We live in the Pacific Northwest. We get tons of rain, so sometimes these things help us to uh, get our seeds to germinate without getting flooded, um, we've created the Stealthy Hot Box Kit. And this kit includes the four garden brackets that I talked about to help you build your box, but then it also contains brackets and units to put your PVC pipe directly in. And then um, it's just going to make it so much easier for you to get them to get your greenhouse built. It's hard to explain on a podcast, but the Stealthy Hot Box is so cool because you can make it super quick. You can make it a number of different ways. So we've done ones with corrugated plastic that we can see through that's heavier, more sturdy. We've also done it with just the regular Visqueen over the top of the PVC pipes. So in these two kits, you're going to get the metal bracket pieces. We're not going to obviously be sending you the wood. We're not going to be sending you the corrugated plastic or the um, 
uh, any other plastics. Um, but what we will be sending you is all the pieces that you need to put that kit together easily. So I recommend that you go to our website, to our store, uh, stealthyhunter.com. Go to our store there and see the um, offers that we have. The cool thing with the greenhouse, the hot box kit, we have two options. So some people have just regular gardens and they don't care really what the brackets look like. So we have just a raw metal um, kit that will allow you to put your box together quickly, but it will over time, you know, it's just raw metal. And so it might little rust a little bit. It may not look quite as good as what you're looking for. So we're also offering a, um, a kit that's going to be uh, spray coated and it looks super sharp. So if you have, you know, a garden that's more ornamental or you want these pieces of metal to look good for years and years to come, go ahead and look at the painted kit because that's going to give you a l much longer wear um, and it's much prettier to look at. Of course, it's more expensive, but for you and what you need in your garden, that may be what you like. We've kind of added both to our garden, so it's it's pretty cool. Um, again, go to our store, stealthyhunter.com, and find those garden kits. We are currently in pre-sale mode. So get going on those. Um, raised beds, greenhouses are an excellent way to go for your beginner garden and um, besides it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun to put these things together and we've made it easier for you Okay, we are back here at the Hunt Harvest Health podcast. Today, we are going to start a series of podcasts that we have been meaning to put out for a while, but just haven't quite gathered all our thoughts together on doing it, but we're going to do it. It's going to be, I don't know, right now we're thinking a four part, I don't know, maybe six part series on different aspects of getting ready for a gardening season and picking a, you know, doing gardening basically. We probably get, <laughs> besides Ryan getting a lot of gear questions and food questions, we get so many questions on gardening. Mm -hmm. And when you do garden and you've been a seasoned gardener for a while, you kind of take advantage, you kind of start thinking like, oh, that's such a simple question. It's not that hard to figure out. But really, um, the basics are super important. And I think gardening can be very intimidating to people uh, because it seems kind of overwhelming, all the things that you have to know and do and, I don't know, pay attention to when you're trying to grow a plant, right? Yeah, I know when I first started, um, my dad was really into gardening. And I didn't know if my soil was good. I didn't know if I needed to add certain things. When I first started planting, um, I didn't know what any anything was. And so, yeah, it was intimidating back when I started, but now you're always learning things. I'm still learning. You, know, you can never like mm -hmm. get a handle on everything. It's just too much. And there's always cool little hacks and tricks and things that you can try. And, um, you know, you just it's just a learning process every year. So, um, you know, there's really, you got to jump in and just start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Fortunately here, we got really good soil. So uh, that was never an issue for us. We never had a massive failure when we started mm -hmm. um, because of, uh, you know, whether it was high acidity or too alkaline soil or anything like that. Um, yeah, you got some pests that you got to deal with every year uh, in one form or another, but that is pretty much everybody's problem all the time. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot to learn and there's something to be said about figuring out what you want to grow, why you want to grow it, um, what kind of dirt's going to work. And if it's not working, that can really be a bummer because you may have planted and by the time you figure out it's not working, yeah, you're weeks in and now you're behind. Yeah. And so you kind of want to get it dialed in the beginning if you can. But like I said, you're always learning and so um, every year I'm, I'm trying new little things and trying to add little things. And fortunately here where our little plot of land is, we've got really good soil. And um, all we kind of have to do is, is, you know, mend it a little bit, add some things to it. 
natural compost, fertilizers, all mm-hmm. those types of things. So. so what we're going to do to break it down for everybody out there in kind of a simplistic way so you can take notes and it's not too overwhelming, you know, we're not going to do like a two-hour podcast here on just gardening. We're going to break it up into topics. And today we are going to talk about kind of the first step essentials. What you need to think about when you are first thinking about doing a garden, where you want to put your garden. Um, And there's a lot of little things that you don't maybe think about. You think, oh, I'm going to go grow some tomatoes. You know, you kind of need to have the right spot, the right amount of sun, the right amount of heat, like all these things. We're going to talk about just in this podcast, we're going to talk about some essentials. And then in the podcast, the next podcast, we'll talk about soil, um, which is, as Ryan's mentioned here, very important. And a lot of stuff that can help with soil and your soil quality. And then the third one, we're going to talk about, like, we're really into garden beds and greenhouses. And Do we believe in garden beds? We believe in garden beds. <laughs> You'll have to go to our Instagram for that joke, but uh, then we're going to talk about that and that'll help people kind of decide how, um, you know, what type of um, gardening, I don't know what they are, structures you want to use in your garden. And and then we're going to talk about probably like seed germination and some of the things that help, you know, help you actually grow a plant <laughs> besides the soil. So soil is important, but there's a lot of other things. So, and we'll probably have other topics as well, but this is where we're going to start today. So today we're just going to talk about the essentials of a successful garden. Um, you know, Ryan and I, we grow a garden mainly for the health benefits and there's so many health benefits besides just the healthy food for us. You know, I know Ryan enjoys being outside all the time. And so for us, growing a garden is also about being closer to nature, um, being closer to the plants, especially the plants that feed us and and nourish our bodies. Um, It helps our children to understand where their food comes from because they're in the garden a lot with us. They're planting, they're picking carrots, they're eating strawberries out of the garden, you know, that kind of thing. We feel that both of us were um, exposed to that as young kids. And we feel that that's really a, probably a foundational piece of why we are interested in this now. And so um, I think it's important to, before you actually start a garden is to understand your why, because like, (laughs) <laughs> Ryan said it's a lot of hard work and you can get discouraged and then not want to do it and and maybe you only get you know one strawberry out of all your strawberries and you're wondering what happened or the slugs got them before you did well strawberries are easy it's your tomatoes and yeah peppers you want to worry about. yeah and so I think that I just is always like, okay, what's your why and, and why do you want to grow a garden? And, you know, if you listen to this, you probably just want to be a healthier person and have less hands on um, your food, right? So you grew it, you put it in the kitchen, you cook it, that's it. I heard another big recall the other day on, I don't know, spinach? You so said romaine. Was it romaine? Yeah, that was it. Much people getting sick. Yeah. We've not had a recall out of my garden yet <laughs> so far. I can't remember us ever getting sick out of eating some out of the garden. No, no. No, we don't. So that's, these are kind of, you know, just a few of our whys. But um, gardening is just really good for you. And, I mean, heck, you know, all that stuff's in the grocery store and you can go buy it and it's a whole lot easier. But this way, I think, is way more rewarding. So, yes, like to start there. Just, so what are we going to talk about? Like where? Let's talk about first zones. Why don't you explain zones to people? Because that's important. Oh, man. So zones. Um, How do you explain zones? I know what zone I am in here. We're in zone eight. Mm -hmm. So zones kind of, oh, man. Uh, What I I know about zone eight is they've got, like, if you you punch it in on your computer, you can kind of look at dates. Put your zip code in. When the last, generally when um, that last freeze is, ours typically in zone eight. I think it's May 1st, they mm-hmm. determine. Um, Tomorrow. It's, it's about the last freeze of the year, so you're pretty safe planting from that point forward. And then the first freeze of the year, I think we're generally end of October, so you kind of want to have your stuff pulled out prior to it freezing, um, especially like the peppers and the tomatoes and all that. But mm-hmm. um, I would just, I'd recommend anybody get online and just look at where you live, punch in your zip, find out where your zone is. Um, you can kind of look at, you know, what kind of weather, what kind of heat. Most people already know this, uh, especially if you've lived in an area long enough, you kind of know when the last freeze is typically. 
Um, you know, and I do cheat a little bit on when they say to plant. I try to go early and I hope for the best. I hope I get lucky and don't have a freeze. And, um, you know, you can do a lot of starts indoors using heat pads, Mm -hmm. um, artificial lighting, that kind of thing, and, and get a real good jump to your season there. But also I do put some stuff in the beds and hope to get some sunny days in April to uh, germinate everything, get it, get it a, a little bit early of a start. And some years it works out well and some years it doesn't. Um, one thing I've found though, we get a lot of rain, like a ton of rain. So this year has been really, really wet. And if you don't have a covered and you're, and you're planting, hoping for germinate, uh, your seeds to germinate, they're just going to drown out like yeah. a rat. And, um, <clears throat> Yeah, you're just going to, your seeds are going to mold. They're going to not germinate for you. And, and I think a lot of, I, you know, if you didn't know anything about garden, you wouldn't think about that. You would think, oh, water's good for seeds, right? And I'll, it's not freezing out anymore. I'll go plant my seeds water where we good. live. It's heat. like. But when it's just water <clears throat> and a lot of it and yep. it's just sitting in water. That's and we thing. don't have any sun and then it's just sitting there. And so then you realize, oh, seeds don't do well in too much water either. So. Um, yeah, the best thing to do is to start it indoors if you have the space. We don't have a lot of space. I utilize a little bit of space in my garage, um, running heat pads to kind of keep that soil warm and some artificial lights. That is um, kind of what I use for like the peppers and the tomatoes and any well, starts that you want to use. You don't heat your greenhouse. That's why. Yeah, I don't. That's a that's a big energy suck when you yeah. heat your greenhouse. If you had like a greenhouse with like a wood stove in it or something in a colder climate, you could do that. You know, you could plant in your greenhouse a lot of people do i see it on instagram they are see sowing sure. their seeds in their greenhouse yep. but they maybe even they live in arizona or they have heat going in their greenhouse well, yeah i mean you can either i mean you can plug in and just you know use electricity and run heaters or you know propane stove something like that a wood stove man i got too many things to man my greenhouse all day long and keep that thing going and keep mm-hmm. it warm but um maybe if i didn't work and you worked I could just stay home. Wait, I do work. And keep my greenhouse warm. <laughs> you need to work oh, more you mean so just me I don't work? have to work. And then I can just Oh my gosh, I feel like if I work anymore, I'm I'm never you people will never be getting a podcast ever again. <laughs> and we'll need to just have Ryan wear a GoPro through his day. <laughs> well, I would prefer to stay home and I man know. my greenhouse and I would too. Just plant year round. That'd be great. I would too. I think it's it's fun to be out there figuring all that stuff out, you know. Um, okay, so we talked about zones, and obviously zones are like, you know, we are in we are. Yeah, we I'm are, not an expert on zones no. because I've lived in this zone my whole life. Yeah. I just kind of know this area when to start. But let's take for example, like I grew up in Montana, right? Montana is a zone. Well, it kind of there's all over the map, but it's a zone two through a zone four B, and that means you may, you know, your last frost could easily be probably June or something. So you got a really short growing season. And this is where we're talking about having structures to maybe help um, keep the heat in. So this, this may be where you need to start everything in a greenhouse, right? Because you're worried about frost. You may need to be heating um, that kind of stuff. Obviously, you live somewhere like Hawaii. Boy, you're going to have you're even growing, growing year round. all year round. Yeah. And you can grow all the yummy good stuff. It's a paradise over there for... I know. For Puerto gardeners. Rico too. Puerto Rico, any of those Caribbean islands, anything like that, you can you can really uh, grow all year round. Okay, so yeah, make sure you know your zone so you understand and you just don't do a lot of work for nothing. Yeah, basically. Yeah. It is a lot of work for nothing when you plant everything and then nothing comes up. Nothing happens. It's a big time suck there, so... Yeah, big time suck. <laughs> Okay, so our next topic, how about finding your space? Finding your space. Yeah, we've had we've had the same garden space for years and it's expanded. Though it started smaller, it's expanded and obviously grown over 20 years, but it's yeah, been I, pretty consistent for us. I think for me you can't have too much space. I know. Cuz um, you know, you think a little 4x8 garden box, that's good. you know, you can get a lot of food out of that. You can get a lot of greens out of that. Mhm. But there's all these other things that you want to grow too. So you add another one, you add another one, you add another one. So obviously if you can find a little corner of your yard or whatever you have to um, to know that you're going to want to get bigger. Hot well, houses are the same way because they're yeah. 
I started out with these tiny little um, hot houses that I would just be their portable like tractor styles. And then I went to the giant one. And now it's 30 feet long and I still want more space. I wish I had two of them. So, um, yeah, always, always try to find a, a corner where you can keep expanding it. I would yeah. highly recommend it. But there's a lot of people who aren't as fortunate as us. They don't have, we, we don't have that much acreage. I think people assume we have like no, acres tiny. and acres of land. We have a half acre. So you can do, and, and literally not even half of our half acre is gardened. We, we could turn, we could have a half acre of garden. Like some people I see on Instagram, like that would be your job. You couldn't have a job. We but are just one family. We I know. That much and, and this is like the homesteader movement. So this is what people are doing when they homestead. Um, obviously we probably couldn't, um, raise cattle here, but a lot of people are quitting their jobs and they are basically growing a small farm in their backyard and they're selling their produce for, for money. Um, uh, that, that guy, Charles Dowding, he's a great guy to watch on, um, YouTube. He's in England, but he has a half acre garden or a quarter garden, his whole yard. He gardened with the lasagna style gardening, no dig. And he, they sell all their produce and that's how they live yep. and it's amazing his videos are great so you know you can do it with a small thing but picking your space is really important because maybe you don't have that much much space maybe you don't really have a big backyard maybe you have well, to do it in your front yard everybody's you know? gonna kind of know like or where deck. how much space i think maybe not the where because the where one thing you got to think of especially if you have any trees in your yard obviously mm -hmm. you want full sun you want an area that's got at least six eight you know, hours of sun a day. That's pretty important. Um, obviously you don't like, like when you plan out your garden, um, and every year I kind of think about different, different plants that I'm planting. Obviously the sun is going to be from the South. So you kind of want to just do the math when you're laying out your garden boxes and everything that, uh, that you realize where, where the sun is going to be hitting mm -hmm. it the most and you're going to get full sun. Um, one of the things also where you don't want to plant your garden is over a drain field. I know many folks right. have made that mistake where they just, oh, there's a little plot of land right there, a little chunk of ground. I'll just put it right there. Well, even with like a raised bed or anything, you do not want to put your, your garden over your drain field. Explain to people what, have, what that means. Some people don't understand. Why wouldn't you want to put it over a drain field? Well, it's a toxic hazard. For one thing. So what's happening with the drain field? The gas is coming up out of yeah. the ground and going into your <laughs> well, soil. Some people don't understand food. that. They okay. don't know. So they buy a house. They've got a little drain field. They don't even understand what that means. It's got grass over it. So why would you think okay. anything different? Yeah. And they Stuff plant something over it. that goes into the toilet goes somewhere. Usually right. into your yard. If you have a drain field, it does go into your yard somewhere, wherever that drain field is. And, um, yeah, that's, that is not a place that you want those toxins and gases to be coming up and exposed to your, your garden roots and your soils and hmm. yeah, it's pretty nasty, but yeah. I know a lot of people <laughs> have screwed up and mm -hmm. put so you need to know your trees, layout of your house and your drain field. So make sure, yeah, not you a, know, not a bad idea to figure out where your drain that. field is if it's in your yard. Yep. Um, and also with the sun, so because we live in the Pacific Northwest, you know, getting to six, six to eight hours of sun in the, in the, in the good part of summer is good. But, you know, starting out this time of year, like tomorrow's May 1st, it's raining outside and it's darker during the day still, even though our days are getting longer now, we're getting more hours of light. We don't necessarily always get a ton of sun this time of year. And so this is where for us, we like to use the structures like the the hot boxes, the cover-ups to keep the rain off of those seeds so they can germinate and also to keep some heat in when we don't have a ton of like direct sunlight. Um, and also think about like trees and fences and, um, yeah, and they can come, they can be an advantage too. Like I've got mine up against a fence. So I really get full sun all morning, all day. And then in the evening and afternoon, I get some shade, which is great mm -hmm. for certain, for certain crops. So not a bad idea just knowing that um, research what you're planting realize how much sun they you can kind of dial in each each thing and figure out how much sun is best for that crop that you're planting some crops don't you don't want full sun all day long that can be a hindrance so right. um, but then there's some that you do 
Yeah, so I think it's like to test where the best sun would come from is like you face south, whatever your south is. You face south and then you put your arms east to west. And that's going to be the direction that you're going to get the most sun over you in the summertime, right? So let's say like if you have huge trees on the south facing side, you're going to have, you know, and you don't get a bunch of sun during the day, that's going to be a big problem for growing a garden, right? Especially some foods that need that sun. Um, so that might be a big problem, right? Yeah. If you have a big fence or a huge tree that's in the way the whole time, something to think about there. Um, but most people have some area of their property where they have good sun. Hopefully yeah. it's not on your drain field. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a bummer. Yeah. Um, and then what... What about slope? I guess you might want to consider the slope of your yard. Um, the slope of your yard. I mean, I guess some people um, have hills and they don't have like totally flat gardens. You know, there's tends to be a little bit of slope. Um, and if, if your slope's facing north facing, right, you're not getting as much south facing sun again. Sure. Yeah, I, I can't really speak to that. I've never had a, a big slope. Mm -hmm. So obviously, yeah, you don't want to plant on the side of the slope where you're not getting full sun. Well, if but you live in Arizona, that'd be opposite. You would probably want a north facing slope if you yeah. had it because, um, and from what I understand right now, like May 1st, um, they're starting to harvest their gardens right now, right? Because the heat is already coming and it's going to be pretty bad in a month or so. So they're they're or they've already yeah, grown get, their garden in the winter. They're harvesting right we now. We get some photos of some pretty fantastic crops coming in yeah. from now. I mean, the last month, and and um, I'm jealous because we barely are getting ours in the ground, and they're they're reaping the whole rewards of their summer. So. Yeah. So then maybe if you had a north facing slope, you lived in heat like that, that would be a benefit to you. You would want that. You wouldn't be getting that south facing blazing sun all day long on your greens and stuff. Yeah. Because you're getting plenty of heat. <laughs> heat is the other thing, right? It's sun and heat. So um, sun is good, but, you know, in Arizona, direct sun is yeah. pretty intense. And also pay attention to, like, <clears throat> when you're thinking about your garden, kind of figure that out in the springtime mm -hmm. um, as to where the sun is is coming up and going and, and all that. Um, it's a little. It's going to be a little more telling than, than when you pay attention to that in the winter. So, uh, okay. What about water? We don't have a problem with water. We have too much water where we live. Yeah, where can we put some of our water? <laughs> hey, how you Arizonans? You want some water? <laughs> yeah, we where we live. Our property is a low lying property, and we definitely um, in the middle of winter we have a lot of water. We have a sump under our house as well, so our back forty is full of water. But then it grows great vegetables like corn and stuff in the summer because it's, you know, been very yeah, raspberries, hydrated. Raspberries, raspberries grow really, yeah. really well. Um, yeah, obviously if you're, if you're thinking about your, the area that you want to plant, think about the water source because you don't want to be having yeah. to carry buckets of yeah. water from, if you're using city water or, you know, a hose from some a spigot on your property, you don't want to have to uh, carry it too far. So you obviously want a good source to uh, be able to water daily. Yep. On our property, ours comes from our house, so we have a hosing system. Mm -hmm. We've never set up an irrigation system. I guess you could, a slow drip thing. We've just never done yeah, there's it. There's advantages to slow to yeah. seep hoses and whatnot. I've just never been a fan. I've never used them that much. Mm -hmm. I prefer to kind of go out there in the mornings and or in the evenings more so, um, and give it just a full water and just hang out out there and, mm -hmm. and water it myself. So, yeah. So always thinking about, you know, what's your water source, where are you getting your water from? Um, gardens do need water. That's a big piece of it, just like they need sun. Um, and if you do live in a drought resistant area, you might want to think when you're planning about what you're going to plant, you know, maybe more drought resistant plants. And Absolutely. foods, you know, yeah. um, there might be some things. I mean, there's some things in our zone we just can't grow. They just don't grow here, right? So there may be some things in, in your zone you want to check. You know, it sounds great to grow like us. I'd love to grow an avocado tree. That ain't going to happen here. You know, just not enough hot sun and heat kind of thing. So, um, I, again, that that's probably getting back to more like what are you going to grow? What are you going to eat? Like, Yeah, I mean, 
it, we could go over every single individual plant, but I would just recommend to anybody just do some research and figure out the foods that you want to grow, yep. the foods that you enjoy the most, you might get the most benefit from, and just do some research and figure out the ideal conditions, you know, the soil conditions and the sun conditions, and if they're a better hot weather or a cool weather plant, um, you know, every single thing kind of, you can kind of dial in and um, just take some research, but it is kind of fun, you know, and make notes, um, put it in a tablet, and year to year you'll just get better um, at amending your soil and amending, you know, just changing where you plant a certain crop versus I've got boxes that um, you, know, you can try to change out your crops every year. You don't plant in the same spot twice. If you're planting spinach, for example, you wouldn't want to plant spinach in that same spot. But I've got I've got areas in my garden where my spinach is great. You know, it's nice and cool with the shade of the of the fence where um it does not do it would not do very well on the um on the eastern side of my garden it's just too much sun they bolt a lot too uh, just too much heat so each crop kind of has its little sweet spot and um no it's kind of fun just figuring those things out and uh it just takes time and years of practice Mm -hmm. yeah it does for sure okay uh drainage is obviously important. Like we talked about, we have a lot of water, so you need soil that drains really well. And we'll probably talk more about that when we talk about soil in the next podcast. Yeah. We'll talk about drainage. That'll that'll be a good thing. But um, uh, closeness to the house, you know, I guess if you have a small piece of property, it's close to the house. And for us, you know, it's not super close to the house, but it's like close to the house. Um, yeah. Well, look, some people are going to be growing in buckets. Yeah. Like if you don't have a hunk of land at all, Geez, by all means, you can you can do a lot with a bucket or a pot, you know, whether it's like a whiskey barrel or... Yeah, we just got a huge whiskey barrel thing. You could plant a lot of that. Well, yeah, there'll be, you know, probably two pepper, big pepper plants going into that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I plant a lot of peppers in just large pots or little three to five gallon buckets. Uh, obviously, you, you um, stick some holes in the bottom of the bucket for drainage, but... Now, if you get the soil right, you can do amazing things with buckets, just tiny little pieces. And they're mobile. You can move them around inside the hothouse. You can move them out on hot days and um, let them get full sun. And so, yeah, I I kind of enjoy, like, putting them in smaller areas and not having them confined to big beds. Uh, it's, it's just, I don't know, I probably do 35, 40 different pots and buckets that I can move in and out of my hothouse mm-hmm. at times. And that's worked really well. And if you got a really good, you know, composted soil and a good fertilizer, you're, um, man, you're not really losing anything. So. Well, here's the big one where we live: natural predators. Well, you know, I guess it's not a, it's not huge. Our natural predator here slugs. is slugs. We got a lot um, of slugs. If you live somewhere like east of the mountains here i mean you're talking deer and all kinds of things can get into your yard we where our yard is fenced so we don't have deer coming into our yard we don't have like rabbits ever or anything like that it's mainly slugs um they get in and they will destroy an entire entire new planting of um you know you just planted something out of the seedlings you took them out you planted them you come out the next day they're all eaten you're like what yeah so you can make this fun too yeah going slugs. out with your daughter <laughs> or your kid and attacking slugs every night as the sun is going down and they're coming out especially on those wet nights mm-hmm. yeah you can take a bucket out there and just <laughs> me and paley she used to just love catching slugs and throwing them in the bucket mm. i don't know about our little yeah, she's three afraid year old of now. She she'd probably run the other way. She's not into slugs, but um, Paley was always really good about going out and helping me attack slugs. And then there's obviously things that you can add to your soil. Uh, coffee, used coffee, is a good one. It's a really good fertilizer. It's also a big time slug deterrent. So mixing it in with some of the soil uh, down by the roots, obviously that's kind of twofold. Keeps some of the pests away, even others other than bu- uh, slugs. And then also, you know, there's, there's so much used coffee grounds readily available. You can just go to any espresso stand or mm-hmm. whatever, and they're usually pretty open about, yeah, you know, just take a, here's a five-gallon bag um, or a five-pound bag, and they'll just, they just want to get rid of it. So um, utilizing that and just kind of making a barrier around your garden boxes with coffee grounds, used coffee grounds, that, that helps a lot. It's 
it's free. Mm-hmm. It's it's uh, works really well with slugs. Um, yeah, why don't you share your um, s- slug juice recipe? Slug juice? Oh. <laughs> so I'm not a drinker at all, mm-hmm. but we do buy some beer around mm-hmm. here, so the cheapest beer possible. Um, yeah, we've used that in the past. And, yeah, my daughter, that's what she thinks of beer. It's like it's just slug juice because it kills slugs. Mm-hmm. So if you take a can dump a little bit into something covered ton i mean the slugs are just drawn it must be the hot i don't know what it is but they're just drawn to that beer and then you know you leave a little bit in the can and kind of tip it sideways and then water doesn't go into the can but it's like a little slug trap um but my daughter she's never seen me drink a beer so <laughs> she sees other people drink beer she's like why is why are they drinking slug juice dad it's <laughs> disgusting because all she knows is it's like a slug bait and it brings in slugs so yeah i mean we we've been using that forever i think it's the best i think it works the best of anything um yeah, it's placing it around like in the strawberries or all these places we just place these little cups of it that's and they where just I crawl use it, right into is it into the strawberries because yeah. if you have a raised bed and you got strawberries in there man those slugs will find little spots if they get through your barrier if your barrier you know you, you kind of um you just kind of forget about your barrier and the coffee isn't there and some slugs get in, they will find areas around your raised beds to hide if there's any little crack or any little shaded area. So I'll put those in as like a double whammy for catching any slug that gets through the coffee. Um, I mean, beer just pulls them right in. (laughs) If there's one that gets into your strawberries, the beer takes care of it. So. Hmm. Yeah, so there's probably people listening here who maybe have never even seen a slug. I don't know. They live in such dry, arid um, climates that that's not their problem. But pests, like pests and predator control in your garden are definitely an issue, you know, you need to address early on because nothing worse than, again, planting in a whole crop and then just... As far as pests, I mean, you're going to run into pests no matter what. If you're growing like this organic garden, you're going to have little leaf cutters, you're going to have, you know, aphids, you're going to have all kinds of little pest problems um, because they like, you mm-hmm. know, eating uh, some of what you grow. So it's it's just a never-ending battle. It's kind of fun. It's a little mm-hmm. war on pests that you always are playing with. Aphids are a big one that people just can't stand because they, they kind of gum up your greens and they're pretty gross. But, um, you know, getting rid of aphids is starts with getting rid of the ants. So uh, it's just take, it just takes a little bit of research. So every time you do get a pest, um, there's usually something you can do about it. And mm-hmm. it's, you can do a, a natural remedy to try to eliminate that pest if, if you're diligent about it and you do some research. Yeah, and I mean, you, like you just said, you know, we, we do it organic. Like our soil doesn't see chemical fertilizers. It doesn't see petroleum products. It doesn't see those things. And... Um, that tends to mean your crop well, in general just has a little bit. I don't want to spray a bunch of chemicals out there. First off, I don't want to eat it. But, yeah. um, you know, our kids go out and they just pick stuff while they're in the garden. I would not want to put any kind of a insecticide or anything out there at all. Well, it's so. hard. You know, you think about it like where we live, again, the land of the water. So if you're putting chemicals on everything, it, you know, then it starts raining. It's just running off into, and you know, we have enough like pollutants, <laughs> oil and gas and all these things that run into our water supply and um, drugs and all kinds of stuff, you know. And um, I would just say the less you can expose yourself to that in your environment, the better. And so we just feel that, you know, dealing with a few pests here and there is worth it. It's, you know, like Ryan said, it's kind of a challenge. He's the hunter and the family he likes to challenge. There's always something you can do to kind of, you know, war with these pests and get rid of them and and figure it out. And some of them aren't that big of a deal. Like they eat a few holes in your greens. It's not the end of the world. You know, the greens are still fine. Yeah. um, Slugs will, you know, do a damage or we live pretty bad and it'll frustrate you. But, you know, you once you once you know what they like and coffee barrier and beer. And And we've tried the copper. Copper doesn't really work. You just need you just need several inches width of copper to keep the um, keep the slugs from 
going over it. But yeah, you can do that. I re- but that's a lot because there's so many darn garden beds. It'd be a lot of. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay, then I think maybe the last thing as far as like the basics of starting your garden would be, you know, knowing regulations where you live. We do not live in an HOA neighborhood. We do not have regulations. Um, but, you know, obviously if you're going to be digging in certain areas That's again. funny you say that. My sister, I talked to her the other day and she does live in one of those. Yeah. She told me they are not, they will not allow her to have a greenhouse. Right. Because it's an eyesore. What in the world? Yeah. Hmm. Um, so this is why we don't live in a neighborhood. <laughs> that neighborhood would be uh, better off. It's like, uh, I think that would make it look better. I've never really understood this whole idea that, and I'm sorry for all of you who live in an HOA and probably a beautiful <laughs> house with like a beautifully manicured lawn that I don't have. And I drive by and I'm jealous and I say, why don't I have a house like that? And Ryan says, well, you'd have to live in an HOA, you know, it's just... I've just never understood this well, whole idea of grass. Look, if you though. cannot have a chicken or a rooster or a hot a house, rooster. What in the world? Uh, I could see it? why you wouldn't want a rooster in um, the neighborhood. But yeah, like, what is the point of grass? That's my question. Grass is a huge resource, so it'd be one thing if you were like cutting your grass and like I don't know. There's lots of things people might do with grass, but. Uh, to me, it just seems like the whole idea of that you can't put a greenhouse on your property, but and yet you have to have your lawn perfectly manicured and green and fertilized and perfect so that when people drive by, they're not offended by it. And it's like, what if what if they made everybody create gardens in their front yard, you know, braised beds with vegetables and all this stuff? Well, and, I don't think anybody should make anybody do anything. Well, they wouldn't but, make them, but what if they allowed it? Is my oh, that'd is, be better. Is, is more the, is yeah. a better word. Allow people nice to do that. A and a house makes any place look better. Yeah, like versus just some uh, boring old grass you got to mow every other week. I just feel like it's a ton of wasted resources and Another thing, too, is a lot of those places that you, they are using chemicals on the lawns and they're using it around. So I don't know if you'd really want to be growing your garden in there per se, but you could put raised beds there. You could put some soil in there and have have flowers and just, it just seems like a big resource waste and um, it's too bad, you know. So if you do have regulations and you can't, I don't know, can't put garden beds in or you can't put a greenhouse in, well, then you're probably, you know, going to have I a difficult sneak, time. I would sneak some buckets onto the, my back deck <laughs> wherever I could get some sun. Yeah. So, um, obviously knowing your regulations is going to be important. Um, but anything else for the basics of getting started? Um, no, I think that kind of covers that. It's very basic. Um, yeah. But it's good. Gardening 101. <laughs> so the next podcast, we are going to talk about soil, which is actually one of the most important things that you can do to yeah, grow we better, plants. Yeah, uh, we better get that out soon because yeah. people are starting to garden. And you want your soil, if you're going to get it tested and all that, we need to talk about it. Well, you just need to have less hobbies. Hmm. Oh, and not a job, like you said. And you could just podcast all day about gardening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And spring bear. Oh, yeah. Coming up too. Which is why we need to get these gardening podcasts done. All right. Okay, everybody. Have a great day. Go out there and uh, start a garden. <laughs>